Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Technology titled Yang Service Models Critical to SDN NFV Automation. Today, our panel of experts will discuss how to achieve automation of services and network equipment by using Yang models. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS and our partners Blue Planet, which is a division of Siena, Cisco Systems, and Fujitsu Network Communications. My name is Alan Tatara, Event Manager for the IHS Technology Webinar Team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. So before we get started, I want to highlight some features available for you on the webinar and also how you can participate and make the most of your experience. So the webinar console that you're looking at can be customized in a number of ways. You can enlarge your view of the slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right corner or by dragging down the bottom right corner. And you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and range your console as you wish. Now at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a number of application widgets which contain additional features available for you. Make sure you check these out during the webinar. And one button I'd like to call out is the resource list widget. Now this is the green button that has a document icon on it. And this is where you'll find additional material about today's topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session. And all these materials can be accessed and downloaded right from your console, so please take advantage of these available resources. So now we want to make sure that this is an interactive session, so we've included a Twitter widget at the bottom of your screen so you'll be able to tweet directly from the console. Today we're using the hashtags Yang and NetConf. We'll also have a live Q&A session directly after the presentation, so please submit your questions or comments at any time by using the Q&A box that's located on the left side of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, and any questions we cannot get to on our call, our panel will follow up with you directly after the webinar. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Howard, who will be leading our discussion today. Michael is Senior Research Director of Carrier Networks at IHS. Michael, welcome, and now I'll turn it over to you, and we can get started. Thanks, Alan. It's my pleasure to be here and lead this webinar this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are. Uh, I've been involved with SDN NFV for four years now. Uh, and a couple of years back, we started hearing about Yang. Uh, so I've been tracking that in our uh, service provider surveys and also uh, dealing directly with the vendors that are implementing uh, Yang and NetConf in their equipment as a configuration tool. So it's, it's exciting for me. We have a lot of great content here today. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of industry experts uh, I'm going to first introduce, uh, so welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, Abel Tong is the Senior Director of Solutions Marketing at Siena Blue Planet. Abel? Hi, Michael, and hello everyone. Glad to be here this morning. I've spent the last four years or so working with customers to really leverage SDN, NFV, and orchestration to simplify and automate their networks. I've also been working with a number of standards organizations over this period of time. So I'm really happy to be here this morning and share some of my experience with automation and uh, uh, Yang. Uh, back to you, Michael. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Abel. Uh, and Carl Moberg is the Technology Director at Cisco Systems. Uh, you'll hear from his voice. He comes uh, from the acquisition of uh, TLF in, located in Stockholm, Sweden. Carl, welcome. Thank you, sir. Good evening, uh, at least for everybody who's in my time zone here out of Stockholm. Um, yep, I've been around for the Yang and NetConf discussion uh, pretty much since it started up. Actually moved out of the U.S. Uh, just a couple of months ago, and I left behind, would you believe it, the, uh, the NetConf uh, vanity plate for my car. Michael, I should have probably given it to you. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm with Cisco. Um, I work in the Cloud and Vir Virtualization Group, and I actually spend quite a bit of time also in standards bodies around the aforementioned technologies. So happy to be here, and back to you, Michael. Great. Thank you. And Fred Grumman is the Distinguished Product Planner at Fujitsu. Fred? Yes. Hello, everybody. You know, glad to be invited to this webinar on Yang. Uh, a product planner at Fujitsu focusing on network operations for maybe the last 15 years. Uh, with regards to Yang, been working on that maybe the last year, year and a half. 
you know, very interested in applying Yang modeling to basically solve, you know, real world problems and build real products with it. Uh, thank you and back to you, Michael. Great. Thanks, Fred. So let's get started. Uh, first, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about market trends uh, to set the scene. We'll then move to problems and challenges that need to be solved. We'll look next at new options and solutions to solve those problems. We'll look at some exciting deployment applications of, of how Yang's used by operators in the field. We'll have a minute each for the sponsors to talk about their approaches at the end, and I'll uh, give the final conclusions. So our goal is to have about 45 minutes of content, <coughs> excuse me, and then have about 15 minutes for audience Q. <coughs> Sorry. So you can certainly ask a question at any time. We probably will wait until the end to get it, but please, as the questions come up in your mind, go ahead and submit them. So to get started, uh, there's no doubt that operators are going to deploy and are deploying SDN and NFV. We've done major surveys the last three years, and here's the results uh, looking at operators across uh, the world. Uh, in different regions, uh, different types of uh, operators, incumbents, competitors, etc. Nearly all of them say they are going to deploy SDN and NFV. Uh, there's a few percent, uh, and in fact, in this survey, uh, those didn't know yet. So there's nobody saying, no, we're not going to. So fascinating. <clears throat> From all that work, uh, it's pretty clear what the primary drivers for SDN and NFV are. And that is, number one, is the service agility for quicker time to revenue. This is what the carriers have been telling us. Uh, and uh, secondly, the global view of services and multi-domain, multi-vendor networks, automation for automation. So a big key here is uh, more efficient operations and agility of uh, services and changes in the network. But there's some barriers, and the biggest barrier is that carriers say, Software is not carrier grade yet. Uh, however, carriers are also working hard to use what is available to put into operation. And there's a lot of uh, operation, commercial deployments of NFV and SDN uh, already. So th the second one is uh, carriers are struggling with, of course, making all the changes to interoperate uh, their existing physical networks and the new virtual networks into their operations, their process, et cetera. So uh, a, a few years ago when I started looking at this, uh, I said, what's a carrier network going to look like in the year 2020? What is it going to look like in the future when SDN and NFD are implemented? So here's uh, a, uh, my view, a simplified, of course, abstracted view of a carrier network that I vetted with CTOs of major the vendors and CTOs of major uh, operators. So basically what we see here is a logically centralized uh, control and orchestration. I call it the orchestrator of orchestrators. Applications come in from the top, and the applications don't ask for network control. The applications ask for some kind of service. So in that middle uh, box, you see a services control and map, and those uh, the this area of the network intelligence has to know what services are available in the network and what services are running. That has to be translated to the actual network and network products, and that's a network control and map. So uh, we're not there yet. This is 2020 vision. Where we are is in the next layer of uh, small gray boxes. These are the domain orchestrators and controllers. Uh, and below that, uh, for example, a content delivery network, business VPNs, cloud services, the mobile core, uh, uh, the optical transport. We're going to hear about a number of these today uh, as individual contained domain, if you will, uh, deployments. And below that, of course, are the SDN optimized network hardware and the NFV uh, commercial servers. The big view is automation, so what carriers are uh, looking for and today is instrument instrumentation or telemetry to gather network and subscriber behavior, do some real-time analytics, I call that small data, give real-time feedback, but then also feedback into for applications control, big data, feeding into OSS and BSS uh, 
policy input. In some ways, some OSS BSS are going to be the orchestrator of orchestrators. But now comes the point of our uh, our webinar today. In order to have automation, the services have to be described in some common way. Uh, and here, uh, as you noticed on the title slide of our webinar, but also in the downloadable white paper that I wrote, uh, here's where I liken this to uh, Qin and Yang. Qin was the emperor of China. He was the first uh, one to organize uh, a bunch of disparate provinces, what are now provinces, uh, to be, create a single entity, uh, China, which has had obviously centuries of duration. That was in 220 BC. So what he did was centralize uh, control, of course, but he codified the language, uh, the laws, uh, weights and measures, uh, and and then had a means to uh, put that that those la the laws uh, into each area, each what is today provinces. So what he set up essentially uh, is the same uh, means that Yang serves, and that is uh, Yang is a, a modeling language uh, from which. So it's a, a common language from which you can, uh, with which you can describe laws, and then you can push those laws down to the fences uh, using uh, essentially netconf. Uh, so the service models are described in Yang. Uh, the devices then are described in Yang, and those are pushed down using netconf. So. That's the basis for uh, how carriers are going to automate. You cannot automate uh, without having those kinds of constructs, common constructs, common language. So with that, we're going to proceed to the problems and challenges. So first, I'm going to ask uh, Carl, how do you see, what are the biggest problems and challenges you see? So thank you, Michael. Um, thanks for that pass. I'm going to tie back to what you said in your carrier SDM and NFV survey, and I think you nailed it. Um, our summary is that the problems that our customers see is literally the diversity of the services that they are forced to launch. Um, so what you would call service agility for quicker time to revenue, combined with a diversity of device interfaces, really, and, and of course this is what's driving most of the hype, I guess, in our market right now is that carriers are wanting to experiment, if you like, with various types of decomposing the network infrastructure, um, ranging from, you know, keep going with existing uh, monolithic uh, physical network functions all the way to truly decomposed and cloud scale uh, virtual machine based uh, environments. And these are two, uh, let's say, dimensions of pressure that really makes life a little challenging because the more diversity of services you have traditionally and the more diverse your device interfaces are, the more complicated your automation gets. So traditionally, and this is the core of the problem that we're going for, traditionally the amount of time spent getting a single or a fixed small set of services up on a single or a small fixed set of devices was huge. And the solution that came out was very brittle. So when you wanted to keep going, i.e. launch new services from change the existing services, um, or you know, actually just upgrade the operating systems on your current devices, uh, you know, which is a far cry from what they really want to do is to try new devices or new vendors, every change was a very slow, complex, and error-prone uh, software project. So this kind of tries to summarize what the core of the issue that we're trying to go after with this model-driven approach kind of is about, is to loosen the link between diver need for diversity of services and device interfaces and the speed and cost with which you need to change those over time. Over to you, Michael. Great, thank you. Uh, good summary. Uh, and I just uh, forgot to mention that Emperor Chin uh, was the one who uh, built the Terracotta Army, so that's the relation to for Emperor Chen to uh, to the pictures of the Terracotta Army. And Abel, simplifying and automating. Uh, great, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm going to 
try and talk through, I guess, some pictures that really describe some of the things that Carl and Michael have mentioned before me. So, I mean, we all understand the problem that we have today. We've got proprietary networking equipment. We've got vendor-specific management systems, and we have silos of management that roll up into heavyweight and legacy OSSs. And so now, as we move forward and start introducing virtualization into the network, we've got new infrastructure, new layers, and more management, more things to management. And at the same time this is happening, service providers exist in a world where it seems like everything's changing. We've got new users with uh, higher expectations and, you know, this uh, seemingly insatiable um, need for bandwidth. So we're trying to deploy new services and, and into new markets and merge physical and uh, virtual networking equipment. So as uh, this road, actually this journey that we're on is not easy. And so before we jump in, let's take a step back and look at what one of our distinguished colleagues, Margaret Chiosi from AT&T said, and she really emphasized that there's no point in moving forward with SDN and NFV if this is really gonna be as complicated or more complicated than what we have now. And so that brings us to our solution around simplification and automation. What we really want to do here, what our mission is, is to help service providers deliver better and faster networks. And we do that, if we can do that, we improve the quality of the experience for the end customer. So the solution involves multi-domain orchestration. It involves us presenting a, a network that's simple and abstracted and is uh, presented as a single integrated programmable resource. And it makes it a network that's easy for us to integrate into the OSS it's simplified and it's automated. Um, back to you, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Abel. And uh, it all seems impossible and there is a lot of complexity, but the simplicity needs to be in the operations of the network, automated and, uh, automated and operable. So, uh, Fred, uh, you see one of the problems of service velocity and I, I agree. Yeah, so, so as, as uh, my colleague Abel kind of uh, mentioned, you know, we want to simplify and automate, and the reason for this is to really accelerate the ability to deliver services. On transport networks, today services are very time-consuming to deploy where it's not uncommon for it to take weeks or months to deliver a service, and that's kind of an instance of a service that's already been defined. To define kind of a new service is, could take much longer, maybe six to 12 months or longer. And much of that is coordinating with the backend systems and making sure that those are implemented correctly. So as a supplier, what we need to do is be able to deliver, integrate, and uh, 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 provide our solutions much faster than before. The products need to be flexible, they need to be adaptable because what a service provider wanted yesterday is probably a little bit different than today, and maybe it will change again tomorrow. Um, which kind of leads also into kind of the software development aspects. Uh, development of software has traditionally followed a very rigorous software development process. Nine months is not atypical to deliver a software release which is kind of one of the reasons you're seeing an industry trend in the uh, networking business to move to more agile software development processes. Now, one area that I would like to talk to specifically that relates to Yang development is the development of protocol interfaces. Today, we spend a lot of time developing the API specs on paper and making sure that they're pretty close to perfect before we begin to implement on both the northbound side as well as the southbound side. And each one usually implements on their independent time scales. Uh, both groups will interpret the specs and implement. The specs themselves are typically not perfect. Usually there's some levels of ambiguity in the specs, which leads to errors of implementation, and then you kind of have to redo some of your software development. So usually it's also very difficult to change the specs because of the impacts to the other systems. So you have a heavy uh, change control system in place as well. So what we're kind of looking for is a better way to develop interfaces, one that helps to automate the development of the software. 
provides a, a, a more accurate uh, documentation of the interfaces and simplifies the synchronization of this development across all parties. And that's kind of where Yang will come into play. Uh, so back to you, Michael. Thanks, Fred. And yeah, so here we're showing the just say no to the waterfall method. Okay, great. So now we're going to look at new options and solutions that solve some of those problems and challenges. And I'm going to ask Fred to come back on here to start. Uh, yes, so going back to uh, software development, we kind of see Yang as being a, a key point in developing future software for networking. And we see this benefit existing on both the embedded systems as well as on external management systems. So on the network element side, we see the benefits to move to next generation management interfaces for transport systems. And specifically, we're looking at NetConf driven by Yang data models. So now this is an interface that has existed for years in the router world, but we do see quite a bit of benefit in applying this to transport systems as well. You know, a couple of features that we really like with NetConf is, is things like the candidate config data store, as well as transactions on the interface itself, really simplifies the development of management systems. Now, now, the Yang models on the network element can help also auto-generate other interfaces on the element, such as maybe a CLI interface, web GUI interface for a more graphical user experience. And basically, Yang can help keep all of these uh, interfaces to the network element in sync uh, in an automated fashion. Uh, we also will be using Yang to kind of do the data modeling for the multi-layer capabilities within network elements itself. On the management side, we see the benefits of Yang uh, to define the fundamental data structures within maybe like an SDN controller system. So it, its use can be used to auto-generate the database schema within the controller. Uh, it can also be used to model the critical APIs that is used to access the controller on both the north side, uh, east and west communication, as well as south to the network elements. So in summary, whether it's on the network element or management systems, we see that Yang supports the ability to provide a well-documented and extensible interface, uh, one that a person could understand easily. It's very easy to absorb. Uh, we especially like that simplified tree view that you get with the uh, PYANG tool, we think that that's a very easy way to present the information. And then when you want to see more details, you go to the YANG models itself. Uh, back to you, Michael. Great. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, lots of uses of the YANG modeling language we're seeing. Uh, Carl, uh, what do you see as new options and solutions? Michael, I think you'll find that uh, you'll have a hard time uh, coming up with anything that makes us not agree across the panel today. You know, I wholeheartedly with agree with everything that the previous speaker said. And let me dive into what we think also is a really a critical transition, maybe focusing a little bit more on the end customers and how we see actually both service providers and some large enterprise network owners really changing the way they, if you like, drape themselves or decorate themselves around um, Yang-based systems compared to, you know, previous generation systems. As we mentioned before, I mean, the really what their issue is here is that they are expected to have very rapidly evolving services. So just being done with a single generation gets you nowhere because, you know, in a very short period of time, you will have a product owner or a product manager coming down the stairs and asking for just a slight update to your most, you know, your most recently uh, updated service or with great new ideas for services that he or she wants to deploy in the network. And frankly, up until about now, most of that has been done through what I usually call the market leading orchestrator, which is the swivel chair, really people sitting in chairs, swiveling across screens and using very informal tools like Word, Excel, and cut and paste into Windows to actually provision services. Um, so what we're seeing here is that they're trying to go from inform informal models owned by the product owners massive amounts of programmers with very little, let's call it domain expertise, just general IT resources, writing huge amounts of service-specific code, and really suffering from the proliferation of 
procedural device adapters, things that are very expensive um, to update over time. And they're trying to tighten this up by leveraging the fact that Yang is a data modeling language. It's a very rich, very precise set of tools, if you like, that allows you to precisely describe what a service actually means to a system that can interpret and run it. And the important part here is that you can come down really in the amount of people you use for this and certainly also in the amount of time you spend on it because you get domain experts that is uh, well-functioning in the realms of Yang, so they know how to express things that are very specific to this domain in formal data models. And these formal data models are normally about 85 to 90 percent of what an orchestrator needs. So it's, it's basically all you need. So you can get rid of all that large set of general IT programmers, certainly get rid of all that fragile service-specific code, and really let that formal data model that can be owned by the product owners themselves drive the behavior of the orchestrator. And if you combine that with open, standardized, and perhaps more, most importantly, interoperable interfaces into the device layer, I'm not saying that's around yet, but uh, we're hard at work on that. Perhaps based on Netconf and Yang, we still think that's, that's the uh, technology combination that has the best uh, punch for, for now. And also introducing things that will be very important in virtual environments, which is plug and play or zero touch provisioning, so that the actual life cycle of that asset, that router or switch in physical or virtual format, doesn't hamper your speed to, to deployment here. That is a huge transformation, and this is really going to change the game across the whole stack, all the way from how we build and deploy networks, what kind of orchestrators we are using, and how we actually put people to this. And just to follow up on that, I wanted to show you a, a second slide. What we really found is that when we started in Onyang a couple of years ago, we worked with a couple of service providers, European service providers, to capture their current portfolio, their resource-facing services, if you like, in Yang. And we found that at the time, and this was about when Yang was released, it was flexible and expressive enough to capture the important parts of that. Now, over time, we've also found that, look, the service itself is just the core, or to say the backbone of what you actually need. So we, we also see abilities to actually use Yang to describe many other things that are inextricably linked to these services. So things like SLAs or service states and service KPIs and going into the virtual domain, things that are related to the applications that you're running. So we really think that Yang also has, really has an application outside of just the basic service and will actually be a key technology for the entire lifecycle management um, of the services going forward. Um, over to you, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, a lot of good information here. Uh, Abel's going to talk a little bit about how Tosca complements Yang. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, I wanted to introduce the concept of Tosca because Tosca is really important in terms of uh, orchestrating and managing services end to end. So as we said before, or as you mentioned, Michael, Yang is a language for describing data modeling. And Tosca, by contrast, is a language for describing the topology and orchestration of cloud applications and actually for describing the entire life cycle, not just the configuration part. So if we look at these two, Tosca and Yang, um, from my perspective, both are really important. We actually apply both technologies, but we want to use the technology that fits best and leverage the strength of each technology where it fits. So looking at Yang, as you saw uh, the detail that Carl presented, Yang is good for describing what something is. So a network device or a service, going through the details and all the, all the attributes of that particular device, it really is a bottoms up approach with a unified modeling language that allows you to represent things in a unified way. Tosca, by contrast, is more top-down. You specify requirements and intent. You have the ability to describe things in the semantics of the language to describe topology, ordering, dependencies, relationships, uh, sequencing of events. And this, these are really important attributes for, uh, for describing orchestration. And so let's take uh, I want to go through an example, but let me just really quickly talk about the adoption of each technology. Tosca, I mean, uh, Yang's been around for almost 10 years now, actually almost nine years. And in that time, we've started to see the adoption or a decent amounts of adoption in the telecom industry. Tosca, the first standard, release 1.0, was released in November of 2013. And since then, we've seen rapid adoption across IT and cloud. And now we see Tosca being applied in the telecom industry. It's really exciting because it's moving so quickly. So let's go through an example. 
Here I show a service I call Service A, which is a connectivity service that includes virtualized functionality, a firewall for security and a router in, in this case. I can use Yang, and we actually do this in our product today, to describe the service itself or the attributes of the service. And for those legacy functionality like routers and firewalls in the network, we can use Yang models to describe the attributes of those devices that we're actually manipulating in the service. But when it comes to Tosca, we use Tosca for orchestration. We create the virtualized network functions uh, through the Tosca templating. We describe the virtual machines, where the images and how they're loaded, how to connect those images or virtual network functions back into the management system. I mentioned we use Yang for configuration. And then when it comes to actually chaining and sequencing these services uh, together with the virtual network functions, we go back and use Tosca to describe that. Now, the example gets more interesting when we start integrating cloud functionality. So say, for example, we want to add a dynamic infrastructure as a, uh, a service, like a cloud compute or a cloud storage component. Well, I can take that initial service A that I created, treat that as a resource, and since it's described in Tosca, just tie it to another template that describes the, uh, the, the dynamic cloud-based attribute and create a new service that a compound piece where I leverage the existing connectivity plus virtualized security as a resource as part of my new cloud-based service. So a really pos uh, powerful concept of being able to abstract and extend uh, the template that I have into, um, into new services. So just kind of in summary of what I've, I've described here, so the networking devices that support Yang will use Yang for configuration. When I talk about networks, inner domain, and connecting wide area network with virtualization and cloud, then um, I really use Tosca for the orchestration. And then when I bring the service together end to end and build reusable components uh, from which I can develop more complex and, and, um, and sophisticated services, I use Tosca for doing that. Back to you, Michael. Great, thank you. Good introduction. So uh, now we're going to move on to the deployment applications of how carriers are using, operators are using these. And uh, Carl, tell us about Equinix. Thank you, Michael. Okay, great start. Uh, Equinix is, as you guys may know, um, uh, delivers Ethernet services cross boundaries um, to a lot of different cloud services. So they basically sell interconnection among other things. And of course, Basically, the issues they had was that they really wanted to free up their assets to cultivate new revenue sources. So they wanted to be able to much faster and much more agile fashion try out new things in their Ethernet fabric. So the requirements was that they wanted something off the shelf, obviously, and they were actually, before we uh, uh, engaged with them, very much invested in the fact that they believed that Yang would be the declarative way of exposing the resources they have to third party, be that outside of the infrastructure team or through actual uh, self-service portals. And of course, you know, tying it all back to what uh, you said uh, early on, Michael, really be able to interoperate with a, a wide or vast variety of vendors that is also ever-changing. And of course, they needed to automate this in order to make any money in this very uh, margin-heavy or margin-tight margin environment they couldn't afford really to have people in the loop. So what they went for was an orchestrated solution where they use Yang to describe the services that their uh, network actually produces. They removed all manual steps so they could really reduce the service activation time. They could really bring services much faster to the market, going back to the fact that I said that their product management can now own and run the definition of a service by owning and deploying the actual Yang model that describes that. Of course, when you get humans out of the loop, people stop fat fingering things, so they stop also introducing failures. And they believe that by actually exposing this through programmatic APIs, they can also start taking on other types of people in the organization, really leverage more computer science-like approaches or more software-oriented approaches to how they um, actually define, and deploy, and sell services over time. So if we look so at the next the example here, yeah, we all Say need to keep moving time. along fairly quickly. So here's SoftBank. Yeah. Here's SoftBank. A little bit more of a complicated solution, to be honest. Uh, they had a, an ex existing set of 
uh, users on their WAN services and their VPN services, and they wanted to introduce new services to their existing customers. So they're looking for a virtual managed services environment where they could start selling or upselling, if you like, services to their existing customer base and kind of introduce service chains into what they have. Obviously, you couldn't do that with manual steps. Obviously, you couldn't really take an, a, you know, a, a, a super linear uh, workload increase and they didn't really particularly like the way that they organized themselves around this because the hits on CapEx and OpEx would be pretty significant. So they went for a full stack Yang solution where all the levels are actually defined in Yang and the interoperability between them are using open interfaces like, uh, like NetConf and RESTConf. And obviously more details to this also on the slide, but with that, I'm gonna leave it over to you, Michael. Great, thanks, Carl. Uh, and I want to just remind the audience, we have questions coming in now, so uh, be sure to put your questions in the queue. So thanks. Uh, and so Fred's going to talk to us about a, a North American carrier in the optical layer. Yes, thank, thank you, Michael. So um, we are working on a open API for the optical layer with some North American carriers and a couple other optical vendors. And the ultimate goal here is really to enable a multi-vendor Rotom network. The, the concept kind of defines the network element into three main components. You've got the Rotom core itself, you've got the transponding element, and then the optics, whether it's fixed or pluggables. Now, the portion that I've been involved in is really the API between, let's say, an SDN controller and the Rotom and the SDN controller and the transponder. And, and, and the key enabler here is, is really defining a set of open Yang models that define the Rotom at these different component levels. NetConf is the protocol of choice, and of course the data model is being defined in Yang. And really, if, if you kind of look at this, the, the use case is focused on the open device layer, and this is what is being done to try to achieve multi-vendor. Uh, there's different models that are being evaluated in this effort. The model that we had proposed was based off of the IETF uh, NetMod Yang models. We kind of used uh, uh, models from IETF for interfaces and alarms, but we also saw that we had to kind of provide some extensions to cover items that weren't currently existing in the standards, things like the equipment model itself, you know, defining the shelf slots and ports, models for performance monitoring, and also extensions for the optical layer itself. Now, now the end goal of this effort is to uh, have a complete set of open Yang models that define the full management of a Rotom network element that is disaggregated into these three components. One other use case that we're working on is, is kind of a, a, a zero touch uh, network automation uh, uh, workflow. And, and so when we are dealing with, with layer zero, we tend to be a little bit more physical. Uh, we, we tend to deal with real equipment, you know, as compared to maybe things that ha happen at, at layer two or layer three. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not atypical for when we have to establish a service that there might be hardware implications. And what we're doing is we're working with a carrier to kind of develop a zero touch capability to automate the uh, infrastructure and service provisioning in, in regards to kind of a layer zero service. So in, in this uh, use case, the, uh, there's a planning system that the operator will design a network build out, and then it, once it's committed, it will push that uh, uh, extension down into the uh, SDN controller. The controller will then you know, push this information to the ordering system to automate the ordering of equipment and also will generate the work orders for a workforce system. In the background, you know, equipment will be delivered, the uh, technician will install it into the network, but at this time we want the equipment to kind of auto-notify the controller that it's now in the network. The controller will then correlate the equipment with something in its plan and automate the pushing of the configuration down to the equipment. Uh, all of these interfaces that we're looking at, we are trying to define with Yang models to kind of uh, uh, help to auto-render the interface stubs on the controller, which helps accelerate our development. 
And it also serves as the documentation for those interfaces that we use within the uh, development of the controller, but also provide to the service provider to help with the OSS system developers to develop their parts of this workflow. Okay, Michael, uh, back to you. Yeah, great, thank you. And so here we see uh, the principle that we're talking about here of having a modeling language in which to model uh, equipment, in this case, uh, the different pieces or parts of a Rotom system, and then workflow as well. So pretty fascinating uh, way to tabularize or and codify uh, operations, services, and equipment uh, in a way that can go across uh, multiple vendors. So another fascinating uh, application here, Abel. Thanks, Michael. I just want to talk briefly about CenturyLink. They're in the midst of deploying an automated, uh, what they call programmable services backbone. And the idea here is to provide programmatic virtualized functionality that really enhances the connectivity services that they're offering already today. And I like this example first because it's a full production network. The first phase is being deployed over multiple countries and multiple cities. Um, but also because it ties nicely back to, to your carrier network architecture 2020 diagram where we see a hierarchical orchestration that's logically centralized with an orchestrator of orchestrators. We see multiple domain controllers, cloud, wide area network, and, uh, and virtualization domains that are actually orchestrated and brought together into end-to-end -end service delivery. And we see automation through multi-domain is actually really key to being able to deliver services effectively in this network. So really, the, what's happened with CenturyLink is that they leverage Yang for the individual legacy devices that they have in their network, and they apply Tosca now to uh, describe the orchestration of those services end-to-end. -end. The net result is faster time to market, lower OpEx, you know, all the benefits that really allow them now to move into new market segments, to be able to address new types of customers, um, say, that need on-demand services, and new markets where, for example, small to medium enterprise, which needed a simpler, easier way to deploy new services. And one more attribute that I wanted to, to mention about this particular network, you notice that there are no vendors and, and uh, uh, technologies mentioned specifically in this diagram. It's really important to be able to have an architecture that allows you to incorporate new vendors, new virtualized network functions, and new technologies that we know are coming out. So that really brings me to the, uh, the next example, and I think this is really exciting. I mean, um, uh, AT&T, Owen Lab uh, have been working together on a project which they announced or released publicly uh, to the public uh, in the form of a proof of concept about six months ago. And the reception since then has been absolutely incredible. I have to say, I can't reveal everything that's coming in the, in the next couple months, but definitely stay tuned because this is big news in our industry. And so the way you think about something like Cord is, you know, uh, I guess let me borrow from Steve Jobs for a moment, but think different. So for the last three, three and a half years or so, we've been looking at NFV or network functions that maybe that we can virtualize. And what we've come to realize is that maybe outside of, you know, photonics and wavelengths and, and some of the, the low-level stuff, we can virtualize essentially everything in the network, and this is really powerful. So let's start with that basic premise that we can virtualize everything. And now, instead of thinking about COs and specialized equipment, let's build data centers. What's great about data centers is we know how to build data centers, and we know how to scale these things infinitely. Uh, or essentially infinitely. And so if we leverage things like the Open Compute Project, white box switching, open source software, the data, data center type of economics are just unbelievably compelling. So what we've actually done with Cord is disaggregate the infrastructure from the functionality. Now you can build a central office, and if you need virtual routing and security services to deliver, say, the example that I, I uh, was going through earlier, great. Put those virtualized functions into your, into your uh, central office. If you need to build a mobile network, say you're going to 5G and you want to virtualize your Evolve packet core, great, do that. You see new uh, residential communities going in, you need to virtualize your content delivery network, put that in the CO. Or maybe you want to just deliver infrastructure or anything as a service. 
put that in this same data center that's acting as a CO. And on the flip side, because they're disaggregated, not only can I uh, have the power of changing functionality anytime I want, I can also upgrade the hardware any, anytime I want. I mean, think about what we're doing today and, the, and the, the, the pain that we're going through to upgrade our hardware to 100 gig or enable our networks for 100 gig. I mean, now it's all data center. The functionality is decoupled. I can upgrade the, the hardware infrastructure without touching the functionality in the data center. So this is really, really powerful stuff. And what's exciting is that when I look at this, the virtualized network function, routing, security, evolved packet core, load balancing, content delivery, anything as a service, these are just applications running in a data center now. And just like my compute, storage, or big data analytics applications, virtualized network functions are just applications running in a data center. And where I am with my data centers today, I'm using Tosca to facilitate orchestration. So if I orchestrate every single application in my data center one way, why would I do anything different for my, for my virtualized network function? I should orchestrate my networking exactly the same way. And what's really powerful about this is that as we move to an environment where central offices and equipment looks more like data centers and we incorporate more virtualization, I mean, we heard John Donovan talking about 75% in AT&T's network by 2020. CenturyLink has a similar target. Uh, Telefonic has a similar target. NTT has made statements also about, about the level of virtualization in their network. And so as we move into this environment, we see an increase in the importance of Tosca for an orchestration and a leveling or decrease in the prominence of Yang. Back to you, Michael. Great, thanks. Abel, and so uh, now we're going to look, and we're running long, so I'm going to have to ask the sponsors to be brief on each of your uh, approaches. The attendees will be able to take a more detailed look at, the, at your slides later. So, Carl, the Cisco solution. Thank you, Michael. Yep, yep. I'll keep to I'll keep to uh, my allotted time here. Um, so, of course, we have what we call a network services orchestrator. I think we actually got some questions about. You know, we're looking at the orchestrators. The way we look at this thing here is that we have removed almost all procedural aspects of it. It's entirely driven off of Yang models, kind of in line with what we talked before. Two main layers. There's a device layer where you use Yang models to describe the devices that you're talking about, independent of whether they're physical, virtual, or kind of network applications like DNF managers, controller applications in daylight and the like, and EMSs or NMSs, just a way of, if you like, uh, putting the structures that you can manipulate in this in a formal data model language. And we do the same thing on the service layer. We really push the definition of what a service is into Yang. And what this fundamentally does is kind of two things. First of all, it reduces the amount of effort, meaning time and money, that you have to spend on introducing new services or new devices by, by being very formal and making the environment between the service layer and the device layer really, really efficient and mostly declarative. And by having Yang models for this, it also opens up for all the northbound interfaces that your audience might want. So applications people tend to gravitate towards things like a REST interface, the language bindings like Java, Python, Erlang, while network engineers, which is also uh, you know, still in abundance here, can keep working through their CLIs or web UIs for the pointy clicky types. And of course, the intent here is that this is not inextricably linked to any particular network service or any particular type of network element, but kind of works across. So we have customers ranging from, as I mentioned uh, before, Equinix for just reselling the network resources all the way into fairly complicated uh, virtualized assets in network services. So with some timing in mind here, over to you, Michael. Great. Thank you, Carl. And uh, next we have uh, Abel who's going to talk about Blue Planet briefly. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'll try and be brief because I really want to get to the Q&A. We've got some excellent questions. Um, Blue Planet is a multi, uh, multi-domain service orchestration platform. We provide virtualization, orchestration, and, and management through our software. We've really managed to combine really best practices from web scale IT and open source into a product that provides SDN control, supports third-party controllers, NFE orchestration, and uh, data center control as well. 
Um, we have a, a methodology that allows us to provide end-to-end -end service orchestration across these different domains, wide area network, virtualization, uh, cloud, and into uh, different cloud applications. Um, we have a model-driven template approach based on Tosca, and we leverage open systems and open source heavily throughout our product. Back to you, Michael. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sable and Fred, for Fujitsu. Uh, yes, so Fujitsu is heavily invested in Yang and developing our next generation product. On the network element side, we have the Onefinity product where we are transitioning to Yang modeling and NetConf as the primary management protocol for the products. On the controller side, we have our virtual uh, NC product where we're using Yang to model data at the uh, device, network, and service layers. We haven't really discussed much about the network layer, but this is something that we see as an important abstraction layer sitting between device and service that allows us to isolate those two layers for multi-vendor on the southbound side and also support custom service APIs for service providers on the north side. So in summary, uh, Fujitsu, you know, we do see Yang as a critical part of our development strategy. It allows us to be agile, react more quickly to the request from our customers, automate software development, and basically we could tailor our product to meet the needs of our, our service provider. Uh, thank you very much, and back to you, Michael. Thanks, Fred. Uh, and so now I'm going to quickly go over conclusions, and we'll get right to Q&A. We have a lot of great questions here. So automation agility depend on service and device model. Yang's the industry choice. Yang's a standard uh, service modeling language to achieve interoperability in multi-vendor environments. We've seen that uh, demonstrated a few times here this morning. Uh, Yang's extensible and can allow quick adaptations. We saw that from Fujitsu in a number of uh, interesting ways. Tosca is complementary to Yang for panel level DNF service orchestration. So great. So let's get to the questions, the audience Q&A. So here we are. Uh, let me get the first question queued up here. And uh, OK, so we have a question from a uh, major European operator. Uh, should an operator now wait for unambiguously standardized Yang models for vendor-specific northbound interfaces, or instead go for vendor-specific adaptations of orchestrators' southbound interf interfaces immediately? Carl, I'll ask you to start that, that one. Really, really, really a key question and something we wrestle with in the standard defining organizations. Look, the just the fact that most of the equipment providers are now switching to Yang is a huge step forward. Just the fact that you have a formal, well-defined language to define the data structures in um, is a great step forward. Now, we all want uh, standardized models, i.e. all devices kind of look like the same, the same type of asset, but that's going to take more time just because the technology cycles on the actual networking side is a little longer. So start now, get used to the tooling change, get used to the language, and keep tension with your vendors so that they move as rapidly as they can towards open, interoperable, and standardized interfaces. That would be my suggestion. Any other comments? Michael? Yeah, this is Abel. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to make a comment here. And I think it's, it, it, just by the wording of it, there's some subtlety involved, and it's actually a very, uh, very perceptive question. And the question is really about where we are today with Yang. You know, as I mentioned, Yang's been around for a decade. Um, it's seen very slow adoption in the telecom space. And Carl said most vendors, well, if I look across, I mean, I guess we have to disagree a little bit. If I look across, say, networks, access networks, transport, optical, mobile, cloud networks, actually the total number of Yang models that are standardized are very small. I mean, there are proprietary uh, vendor implementations, say, say by Cisco. Um, and then in networks where they are standardized, say, in some routed networks, I mean, we leverage those. So, for example, when we use Blue Planet to manage a Cisco network and orchestrate, say, a Layer 3 service creation across a Cisco network, we'll use the Yang models that exist because it helps us. But when we try and, say, do long haul or optical or access or transport, or, you know, there is no model for us to leverage. And in that case, Yang doesn't really give us, the, doesn't really give us an advantage there. So uh, I guess the message is it's taken 10 years to get us this far. 
how long do I really wait to cover the rest of my network? In fact, the majority of my, my network is actually happening in the transport space or the metro space. So how do I actually, I mean, how long do I have to wait till I can cover the metro and the access parts of my network? Any, any comments from the panel, from our participants this morning? Brent from Fujitsu. So, uh, you know, I, I tend to agree with Carl that at least in the short term, you're going to see, you know, maybe vendor specific models. I think the important thing here is probably to support the openness of those models. So that's probably going to be the first step is where vendors really kind of open up their models and maybe it's adapted at a controller level uh, into some common, you know, maybe, maybe a, a device model or network model in, in, in a controller layer. Standardization is still good. It would be nice to get people converging on, you know, common ways to represent the data, but it, it will be a, a longer-term effort. So I, I, I do agree that maybe on the near term you might see more vendor proprietary and hopefully vendor open models. Yeah, I think we're still early in the game here. I know that uh, there's the open config uh, initiative that Google and others are in, and carriers are in. Uh, to define common models on on, on Yang. Uh, so it, I think we're still early in the game here. So the next question is uh, from a major North American operator. Uh, where is the work in the Yang model with respect to the optical layer? It sounds like this is for you, Fred. Is there a draft model extension out to view? So, so I'll answer this quickly is that at this point we're still converging within the group on the model itself, but there is a plan to open it. I mean, we haven't finalized the plan. I, I think it's still maybe three to six months away, but there is an intention to provide this to, you know, as a truly open uh, uh, model. So just kind of stay tuned, uh, maybe, maybe by the middle of this year. Any, any other comments? Okay. So. Uh, there's a question uh, from uh, if cord really happens, what happens to a traditional equipment vendor's business? So, Michael, well, I mean, that's that... part of that. <laughs> okay. So, part of that is, yeah. So, that's what we've looked at uh, pretty extensively mm -hmm. in, in some forecasting. Uh, yeah, carriers, especially in the area of edge routers, are uh, planning to move a bunch of the service functions off of those edge routers and put it, make them run on standard commercial servers. One of the places, uh, and obviously AT&T is famous for this, but also Deutsche Telekom, British Telekom, most op big operators are looking at uh, identifying a number of of uh, large COs in metro areas that will be the place where they have a next-gen CO or a cloud CO, so have a mini data center there. So the operators, a majority of operators are planning over the next few years to move at least eight service functions off of uh, physical edge routers in, onto commercial servers. Uh, and the commercial server uh, can run in the CO, that's the CORD, uh, application, but also might be running in uh, a nearby data center. And then the third place where they might be running is on a, a, a cloud CPE, a physical box that sits at the customer premises uh, on which there's a there's server storage and switching. Any other comments uh, from panelists? Yeah. Yeah, Michael, this is Abel. Um, just a couple of uh, things to add to that. I mean, I, I think CORD is extremely exciting and, and everybody should be paying attention to it. But really from Blue Planet and Tiana's point of view, we're really bullish. We've been involved in CORD for a very long time, almost since the beginning. We, uh, we offer Blue Planet Onos, which is an open source, open network operating system developed by ON Lab and uh, with contributions from AT&T, now Verizon is part of the Onos project, um, SKT, you know, China Unicom, so global uh, contributions to an open source project, really exciting. Obviously, Blue Planet provides the virtualization, orchestration, and management, uh, plus templating that allows you to define the services that go through Cord. And really, um, Blue Planet is 
well positioned to play within Korg. But also when I look at from Sienna's point of view as a market leader in terms of uh, packet and optical networking, it's also exciting too. I mean, we, we have a strong position in terms of data center and data center interconnect and optical networking. And these are all critical technologies that enable a core to really take off. So um, I think it, that for a vendor like ourselves, it's very exciting. For uh, a legacy router vendor, however, as you mentioned, with PEs being virtualized and, and service functionality being virtualized, I think it offers to the providers like AT&T and Verizon, big opportunities for cost savings, but I'm not sure that it's necessarily, I mean, I think it indicates uh, a change happening for, for legacy vendors. Yep. So uh, we're at our time. Uh, Alan has a couple of remarks to make as we close. I wanna say that we do have all your questions. Those that are unanswered, we'll be able to get back to you. Uh, the panelists will be able to. Uh, we could have, there's a bunch of great questions here. We could have gone on for another half an hour. So I want to thank the panelists all. Uh, I thought it was a great webinar. I learned a lot during the process and, and even today. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to say thank uh, everybody for joining us. And Alan, uh, any last remarks? Uh, thank you, Michael. And I also want to thank you for leading our discussion as well as all of our presenters today, Abel from Blue Planet, Carl from Cisco, Fred from Fujitsu. We, we appreciate uh, all your participation and, and for this very engaging discussion. So an archived version of this webinar will be available shortly, and we'll be sending you a follow-up email on how to access the archive. Or you can just use that same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So feel free to come back and view this session again, or even share it with your colleagues. And you're also going to see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of this webinar, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And make sure you follow us on Twitter for information on future IHS technology webinars. So again, thank you all for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.